As Chief Economist, Senior Vice President for Stewart Title Guarantee Company, Ted C. Jones conducts research and supports economic and financial analysis for the company and its customers. Dr. Ted is recognized in particular for his applied real estate research. He has completed numerous mass appraisal assignments, including more than $3 billion of income-producing property owned by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, retail properties, hotels, motels, offices, commercial land, that's good. multifamily Let's go on with housing. We only have so much time. That's good. Let's, who's, who's never heard me speak? Raise your hand. So we, we were telling four people what they already didn't know. Yeah. So let's put my slides up there. Let's get on with it. So here we go. Every year, you know, I, it's nice to be back here, by the way. You are, do have a good economy without question. Every year I have a new topic, and this year is no place but up. And I wrote this, you know, this topic. I literally have to define it in October. And I think this year the economy is going up, interest rates are going up, rents are going up. Real estate values are going up, and, and the, overall, everything's going up except for oil and gas prices. And, you know, you speak in Houston, that's kind of a derogatory thing to talk to them about. But you know me, <clears throat> I, I, I think differently. Now, we've had a lot of difficulties traveling initially this part of the winter. And I say, think, Hovens, for global warming, think how cold it would be without it. <laughs> Who kind of remembers that in January, right? <clears throat> So, did you know it's only a myth you can charge your iPhone in the microwave? <laughs> it's not my iPhone, by the way. How many of y'all have ever been on an airplane that a dog stared at you for three hours? <laughs> not like that. How many of you have been on an airplane a dog had its own seat? So, you're sitting there and this dog staring at you. And, you know, I've never done drugs. i got to have problems with beer. Why would I do drugs? And... Dog stared at me, and I'm thinking, God, it can't be a drug dog. I've never done that, but what if it is? Uh, how many of you all been on an airplane where every seat has that display? It's cool. You can watch TV. You can play movies. You can play in-flight trivia. Now, in-flight trivia is really kind of cool, and, and there's a trick to it. <laughs> the trick is to log in as a pilot because you can just screw with every person's brain on that flight. Now, I didn't do this, but I learned it, so I've been doing it since then. Lady next to me says, she says, the pilot's playing in-flight trivia. I said, worse than that, the pilot's only got 10 out of 19, right? <laughs> you hope he's flying the airplane better than he's playing trivia. So you get on that airplane, you log in as pilot, because it'll freak everyone out. I just want to tell you that. Now, this is one of my favorite slides of the year. <laughs> so you got options here. Option number one is you tell them. Option number two is you watch. I'm voting for watching. Who's with me on this one? Yeah, yeah. I love this girl in Texas. You know, everyone's got to learn how to stick shift. She's 16 years old. Learning stick shift, smiley face, keep your distance, please, still scary. We've all been there, haven't we? I mean, we've all done that type of thing. Um, let me tell you, you're going to have to put real estate on sale to sell it this year. But let me define a sale. I live at Home Depot. Anyone else a Home Depot fanatic besides me or Lowe's too? And clearance was 50 bucks, now 49.99. That's the kind of sell I'm talking about. Clearance was 850, now 849. Y'all get it? My favorite one. How many realtors in this room have sold a home in the last 12 months above the listing price? Look at the number of hands. This is that I got a I got a price for you on that one. IKEA, IKEA. Regular price, 100 bucks. IKEA family price, 153 <laughs> I think this is describing what's going on in our real estate economy. It's a lot better than you ever imagined. Now, i got to tell you, I'm a big believer in innovation, but it stops right here. Did you know there's a cooperative of dairy producers in Iowa, and this year they're selling Peeps flavored milk? Now, I looked at it, you know, in Texas we invented horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracking, and shale formations. We got the Texas Medical Center, the medical ports. Iowa gave us Peeps flavored milk. Y'all understand why it's easy to be better than they are, am I right? And no, I'm not invited to Iowa to speak this year. The coolest innovation I found all last year, it is the best innovation in the world. You go to the grocery store and you can buy a walking around beer. I never used to shop. 
You go in the in produce department. Have y'all ever seen walking around beer? You go in the produce department. They got an ice bucket of beer for guys just like me. They're 99 cents a can. You got a dilemma right out. How many are you going to need to get through the store? <laughs> and you put them in your cart and you drink them and you hang on to the empties. And when you're checking out, you stick the empty on the conveyor belt. And who's ever checking you out, they scan it and recycle it. Who thinks that's brilliant? <laughs> and how many men in here are now going to start shopping if you get the same? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I love this one. So I got a, I, I, of course, you know, I have some real estate down in St. John, the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's a beautiful place. My favorite place to go. If you ever want to go to a phenomenal beach, you go to St. John. The reason is two-thirds of the island's a national park. It'll never be built on. The water's warmer than Hawaii. It's clear. I mean, it's just an incredible place. But the reason I'm showing this picture is because I have a new GoPro camera. And my CPA says if I put two GoPro camera pictures in every presentation, I get to tax deduct that GoPro camera. <laughs> so here's picture number one. Are you all with me on this one now? Now, I got to tell you, you know, you were saying it's, you know, you are doing really good in Ohio without question. I accomplish all that. It doesn't happen by natural chance. It's a lot of leadership. It's a lot of leadership that starts in your organizations, too, both elected and your permanent people. Um, but then I have to speak in Cleveland every year. Have you all been to Cleveland lately? So do you want to know, they got so much road salt on the road because all the ice and snow. Here's what a car in Cleveland looks like after four years. So here we go. Four years old with the road salt. Just rusted apart. I mean, that's pretty much it. So let's talk about the economy and talk about the national economy. And then we're going to talk about the local economy. Let me tell you about the U.S. right now, and, and what amazed me during the election is nobody picked up on it that we have a phenomenal economy going on right now. The U.S. has more jobs than any time in history. 58% of the jobs we created last year pay above the median household income. For the first time since 2006, we started creating really good jobs that paid above what we typically were making, and that's incredible. Interest rates remain highly affordable. They are going up. My mortgage bankers in the room, bankers, the quicker the better, am I correct? Quicker the better, whether it's commercial or residential. And lastly, I'm going to talk to you about this thing, and nobody's talking about this, and I think it's the biggest megatrend the U.S. has over anyone else. We have significant demographic demand that other countries around the world don't have, and let me describe that. Now, if you've read any of the books by Harry Dent or anyone else like that, or you've probably gotten this email in the last month or two, stock market's going to crash and burn. And we're going to have another housing bubble, sell your house. How many of you have seen those bozo emails? I don't believe them because they're only half premise. They don't look at the full facts. Part of their premise is, their, their complete premise is that the boomers are going to die. And yes, we will. If you're a boomer if you're born between 1946 and 1964. There's currently 76 million of us. The reason that writers are worried about boomers going away is we boomers drove the most large growth, strong economy the world has ever seen. We were excessive consumers of everything. I mean, we, we ate too much. We drove really too many good cars. We bought super McMansion houses, and we, and we traveled too much. We have no apologies for that whatsoever. But the thought was, well, all these millennials and Gen Xers coming up, they're not going to be there, and, and who's going to replace the boomers? And they'll take all their money and die as they go out and assisted care, and, and the, no one wants their houses, and well, that's true to a point. So the 76 million boomers are going to be replaced by 86 million millennials currently aged 18 to 35. I mean, you all knew there were 10 more million millennials. Oh, by the way, some people are counting millennials down to the age of 15. That means there's 92 million millennials. And we never thought that millennials would be anything but austere people. <laughs> the reason they're austere is they never had any money but daddy's and mommy's money. And now they're getting jobs. In fact, last year, the millennial job growth rate in the U.S. was 60% above all the other non-millennial groups. They're getting really good jobs. Have you all seen that neat little BMW ad, Katie Kirk? Yeah. Did you know millennials note that as their number one wanted car, a car that produces more profits for BMW than almost any vehicle they build? Don't tell me they're going to be austere. When they get money, they, they, they know the difference once they tasted a Bordeaux because they've only before this been drinking Beaujolais. And when they taste the Bordeaux, they're going to want to own it. And oh, by the way, when you buy your own bottle of Bordeaux, you don't share it. 
and they're currently sharing because none of them have anything. So we got this demographic demand. If you were Rip Van Winkle and you went to sleep in any of these countries, China, Japan, the United Kingdom, Italy, France, Russia, Poland, any of those countries and a bunch of others, and you woke up a year later and every country I just mentioned, you would have fewer people living there. Every one of those countries, all except perhaps China, considered the more developed countries of the world, are shrinking in population. China's in so much trouble, people don't realize this. You know, for 50 years, they had one child per couple. You have to have 2.2 children per couple to grow your population. In the next three to six or seven years, China won't have enough young people come up to fill their current jobs. And when China does that, you don't grow an economy. Now, think about that. You, go, you, you wake up in Japan a year later, you have fewer people, you need fewer apartments, fewer retail, fewer subways, fewer restaurants. Do you all get it yet? We're just the opposite because we're a growing country, and that's good news. Mega themes. Number one, more jobs than ever before. That's good news. Number two, we have a retail boom that's just now starting. Who are my commercial people in retail out here? The, the, you're in the hot seat because you are the hot product right now, and it's going to continue for at least a decade. What's going to happen? Oh, let's talk about these millennials. Well, they're not going to buy houses. Well, there's two major studies that say one of them says 44% of millennials currently live with a relative, one says 50%. And as millennials get these good jobs, they're leaving the relative's house, and they're going to rent an apartment or a house, or they're going to buy something. Regardless of what they do, when they leave their home, they have to go buy mattress and beds and sheets and bedspreads and pillows and blankets and knives and forks and TVs and can openers and garbage cans and throw rugs. We are preparing ourselves with this millennial group just starting this household formation rate to the largest single retail boom the country's ever seen. Mark my words on this. Millennials, 61% of them in a recent survey said their primary goal in the next 60, six years so five years, excuse me, 60 months, is to own their own home. Uh, and this other one, how many of y'all tweet? Four people in this room tweet. <laughs> you got a 60-year-old guy up here that tweets. DRTCJ, if you want to tweet with me, DRTCJ, hook up on that one. But you'd already know this one because I tweeted it two weeks ago. 38% of the millennials intend to sign a home purchase contract before they sign a marriage license. That's how high it is, priorities in their, their existence. They understand housing. We've got this residential renting versus owning. My, my lender's in here. By the way, lenders, I'm going to say this to you once. CFPB is a four-letter word. Am I right, lenders? I don't know if anyone in here understands what our lenders are going through right now. And title companies, too. You realtors, you do understand the HUD-1 will not exist as of August the 1st. We're working in the National Association of Realtor Convention last November in New Orleans. We had a big screen of TVs, almost as big as these screens up here. And, uh, you know, a bunch of them put together. And we said, as of August 1, we no longer use the HUD-1. And this realtor says, well, I'll just use another title company. <laughs> and we try to tell her, no, 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 no one's going to use the HUD-1. She says, well, I will. And I realize you're not going to sell any houses either, so... Residential running versus owning. Good news is Fannie and Freddie are now giving 3% down conventional loans. That's great news. Bad news is under the new qualified mortgage rule from a year ago, unless you have pristine credit, you don't get the 3% down loan, which means most of my 30-somethings, 20-somethings, are going to put down 20%. One of the other studies said it's just taking an average 30-year-old couple, typical entry-level couple married or together, whatever, Twelve and a half years to save that 20% down payment. That's a big number, guys. So we're going to have a lot of renters. We'll talk about that in a minute. Inflation potential. You know, I've, I've heard of never, it'll never happen. It'll never be this, never this. All I've learned is never, ever use the word never in a sentence. Y'all got that right. I just did. Remember, I'm going to take you back. I remember uh, going back to 80, 81, 82, and I had a lot of people say interest rates will never come down. They did. Housing bubble. Here and in Florida in 05. Y'all remember when I said prices are going to burst and y'all told me they never will? And then I'm thinking for a couple years after that, you thought they would never go up. They did. We used to think oil prices would never go down. They did. And then we're hearing today they'll never go up. They will. 
we've always sort of heard in the recent years, we'll never have inflation again because what the Fed's doing, we will have inflation. I'm just telling you this. And the cool thing about real estate is both residential and commercial real estate historically outperforms inflation as long as you have a fixed rate loan or all cash purchase. So just remember this. Last year, again, if you're tweeting, I'll mention that again, DRTCJ. My cell phone hasn't buzzed in my pocket yet. You all haven't hooked up enough. You, you, you learn on this one that last year the average home value in the U.S. went up double the rate of inflation. That's a heck of a return. Who agrees? When the CD at my local bank is three-tenths of one percent, yeah, that's a heck of a return. <clears throat> we have, we have a, a still a need and a reason to overweight in real estate on your investments. So I think real estate's the best investment you have out there. I'm going to actually start out with commercial day instead of residential. I'm going to prove that to you. And then I wrote this list between Christmas and New Year's. And I wrote in here, terrorism is here to say it'll never go away. To me, terrorism is just like cockroaches in Florida. You control them the best you can. You can't ever kill them all. Who agrees with me? But you want to kill as many as you can. Does that describe terrorism to anyone in here besides me? It does to me. I'm just going to tell you that up front. So let's look at the U.S. More jobs any time in history. Uh, this is through February. Our job growth rate, I want you to put this job growth rate, you don't care about the U.S. when you care about yours, but I'm going to show you your potential. U.S. job growth rate in the last 12 months, 2.39%. Last month we created 295,000 net new jobs. In the last 12 months, we added 3.296 million net new jobs. Let me tell you how that impressive that is. The last time we added more jobs than that was 1999. We just had the best job growth rate we've had since 1999. Did you all hear what I said? Incredible economy, and it's spilling over here. Now, we're going to do just through the end of the year because this is kind of that. April 2006 was considered the peak of the last boom, and we created 215,000 net new jobs per month. As of 2015, the latest 12 months, we've been created 275,000 new jobs per month. We're creating more than 50,000 more jobs, 60,000 more jobs per month on average for 12 months, and no one's calling this a boom. There, I see these people on the sidelines, well, when is it going to recover? And I'm thinking it's the best job growth rate. It's better than the last boom we had. It's incredible. Now, you do have a few things against you in this state. I'm going to put it out up in front of you. Not going to criticize you. It's your state. You get to do it how you want. Tax Foundation each year ranks all 50 states based on five taxes corporate income tax, personal income tax, retail sales tax, unemployment tax, and property tax. Good news is there are six states worse than you. <laughs> Bad news is there's 43 that are better. Caterpillar, last couple years, brought a Caterpillar, it's front end articulated loader plant. They'd moved it 30, 40 years ago to Japan. They brought it back to the U.S. Guess where it went? Florida. Why? Because it's the fifth best place to do business in in the country. And they had available skilled workforce. Available skilled workforce is key. You may want to think about changing some of this stuff, just thought. So we had the election in November. And I'm sitting up that night. I'm going to write my blog for the next day about these things are going to change because the election, and the first thing that came to mind was we'll pass the XL pipeline. And I thought, nope. Good thing we didn't publish that, huh? And then I thought, well, what else is going to change because of the election? That's it. Nothing's going to change. You know, Matt Morris, our CEO, and I were speaking, and we speak every January in Washington, D.C. We're speaking there, and the people are telling us what gridlock D.C. has. And I'm thinking, no, gridlock is your interstate freeway out here at 530. That's gridlock because everyone's trying to do something. In Washington, D.C., you don't have anybody doing anything. In fact, don't call it gridlock. Call it stalemate. If you've ever played chess... Stalemate is when if you move, you lose. I'm going to ask you this. Is the president going to change his stance on anything? Well, I heard today, once again, he blames ISIS on Bush. Did you all hear that today? He blamed him today on Bush, because what Bush did long before he became president. Wow. So presidents aren't going to change. Are the Republicans who just took over the House, well, they already had that, strengthened that, and took over the Senate, are they going to change? Nope. So what's going to happen? Nothing. Is that good or bad? Yes. <laughs> Why is it good? They're not going to pass any more stupid legislation this year. 
Why is it bad? We can't get rid of some stupid legislation. Well, remember, when I say get rid of some stupid legislation, you all really realize that the Senate Finance Committee prior to the election was going to put on the table after the election to eliminate Fannie and Freddie. Now, my mortgage bankers in here understand this. If you remove FHA, VA, and jumbo loans, Fannie and Freddie were the conduit for 97% of all, 92% of all conventional loans made last year. What happens if your buyer of 92% of your loans disappeared? I guarantee you have another session. So that nothing happening is good stuff. Columbus. Now, good news is now, his numbers weren't wrong. My numbers weren't wrong. I think you were using uh, not seasonally adjusted. I'm using seasonally adjusted. Seasonally adjusted said last year, Columbus, MSA, added 8,100 net new jobs. Good news is you have more jobs any time in history. Round of applause on that. Jobs are everything. I've always said there's only three types of home buyers who buy a home that don't have a job. They have blue hair, gray hair, or no hair. We call them retirees. Bad news, your job growth rate is 0.82%. That's a third what the U.S. is. It's a third. And I believe your state business environment hurts you. I'm just going to lay that out there to you. But still, for Ohio, you're doing extremely well. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, okay? And by the way, the elephant in the room in Houston is bad news, and here it's like, woo-ha, yee-haw, let's ride and fire. I'm going to start opening with this chart because it's, to me, the most important deal changer in the lives of our kids and our grandkids. I call this my George Mitchell chart. Who knew George Mitchell besides me? I used to do appraisal work for George. George was a petroleum engineer graduate of Texas A&M. He died a little over a year ago in Galveston, Texas, at the age of 96. He developed the Woodlands. Who's ever heard of the Woodlands? Most successful master plan community in the United States of America's history. Still blowing and going. George Mitchell perfected horizontal drilling. George Mitchell perfected and patented hydraulic factoring of shale. George Mitchell, what he did is bringing manufacturing back to the United States of America. Think about this. Blue bar, read on the left. That's the price per 1,000 cubic feet delivered to an industrial facility. Not a generation plan, electric generation. That's different. Not houses. That's different. Pink line, read it on the right. That's the price per barrel of oil. And here's what used to happen. When oil got expensive, natural gas got really expensive because we would you know, switch as much from oil burning anything to natural gas burning, whether it's turbines or whatever. So when oil gets expensive, you and I stop buying so much other stuff because we're spending so much more electricity and gasoline or diesel for our cars, which means we don't have as much money to buy other stuff, which means we have to buy less of other stuff. Oh, and remember, the people making that other stuff are also having to pay more for it because their energy costs went up. So you've got to get this double down ugly. I'm going to take those people in this room back to 1973, the first OPEC issues, when OPEC, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, came out and they started limiting production. And realize in 1973 is when our manufacturing started to disappear. I always thought it was the labor unions that caused manufacturing to go overseas. Ah. Uh, just as much was energy costs. And I can remember, I had a 1972 Pontiac Grand Prix, 400 cubic inches, 400 horsepower. That car could pass anything except a gas station. <laughs> and I can remember in 73, your big concern wasn't what you were paying for gas. Your big concern was could you get it? Who remembers that? Those are your worries. Now, let's say you're a manufacturer in 1973, and you're General Motors or someone else. You're going to put in a new manufacturing line, very energy-intensive, well, what if you couldn't get the energy and who knows what cost you'd get it at? So what bank's going to lend you the money to do that? So hence, a lot of our manufacturing went offshore, and there we go. So then all of a sudden, you look at this chart in 2009, we started doing all this hydraulic fracking around the country, and we started finding out there's massive amounts of natural gas, copious quantities of cheap, assured energy to run a manufacturing base. And lo and behold, we are. We've seen a resurgence, almost 300,000 net new manufacturing jobs in the last 12 months alone in the U.S. Not only did we get Caterpillar plant, think about this. You all have a Honda plant here. For the second year in a row, for the first time, you actually made more Hondas you imported. It would have made more, but it was at capacity, right? Three models of Mercedes are only exported around the world are only built in Mississippi. If you drive or buy a new X-Series BMW from Australia with the right-hand drive to the U.S. with the left-hand drive, every one of them made in South Carolina. We're back 
manufacturing is back, and that's what's benefiting Cincinnati a lot. It's the next one coming down the line, industrial issues. So I th take my hat off George Mitchell. Commercial real estate actually had a bigger bubble on it than housing did. We went selling from almost $600 billion of commercial real estate in 07. 24 months later, we dropped 83%. I've used this line before, but I'll use it again. The reason we call you commercial brokers is most of y'all went broke. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's a true statement. Now, let me show you the returns on commercial real estate. And first of all, let me tell you where the data came from. A lot of pension funds invest in commercial real estate. Y'all that have a self-directed 401k, you can do the same. You can buy an apartment project or duplex or a condo and rent it out. And the neat thing is if you do that, the only tax you ever pay on, while it's in the, the pension fund or 401k, the only tax you ever pay is property tax. So you look at from Caterpillar to General Motors to teachers' retirement systems to firemen retirement funds, police retirement funds, our big corporate America pension funds invest right now, they have $409 billion invested in just commercial real estate. This NACREF, that's merely a trade association that keeps track of all this. Now, you know, let's, let's say you're, you're Ford Motors pension fund and you buy an office building. Here's the taxes you pay. You, you pay a property tax. You never pay a tax on that property again. In fact, the only person that ever pays taxes on it is the retiree when he gets money out of the fund, he pays an income tax on that. So there's never any capital gains tax. There's never depreciation. They almost always pay cash for them. There's no interest deductibility. So like I say, there's almost 7,100 big class A buildings around the country, over 400 billion. Last year, retail, and they say you paid cash for it. If you look at the change in the property value and the net cash flow to the landlord, last year's retail was 12.54%. Did anyone in the last 10, well, do that from 2013, it was 10.12%. Did anyone on their stocks in 2013 average 10.12%? No. One guy on Wall Street did for a while. His name's Bernie Madoff. <laughs> Industrial. Last year was our best, 12.8%. 13-year average return, 14-year uh, average return, 8.4%. Y'all get it? You understand why we're going to wait, overweight in real estate? Because it's our best returns, and these are legitimate. There aren't anything else. The other thing, I just want to show you this one. Oh, by the way, as always, we will make a copy of the PDF available, so if anyone wants a copy of it, you can get it, right? Y'all with me on this? Please give it out. Get it to you electronically. The blue line happens, this is annual returns. You, you, for example, you can see uh, hotels down at the downturn lost 30% of their total value. They actually lost 36%. They had a 6% positive cash flow, lost 30, 36% net return that year, minus 30%. What I want to point out is the blue line. That's retail. And what I learned was the blue line retail actually is pretty good at predicting the first part of the downturn. And our retail right now is just flat and climbing a little bit. So it says we're in great times. Yes, we're, uh, we were talking earlier about how much more of a global market Y'all are coming here. How many of y'all have dealt with global investors? Yep, look at the hands going up. I just want to show you this, and this is where you benefit much more than perhaps other parts of the country. Canada is our number one buyer of commercial real estate in the U.S. They buy more than three times as much as China. Who knew that? Number one. Well, China's number two, but then look at the next four, Norway, Singapore, Switzerland, and Germany. That's, uh, that's three three six. That's the most conservative countries in the world, and they're now saying that their per preferred place of investment is the United States of America. Do you all get it yet? The rest of the world realizes how good it is to shop here. Yeah, they do too. You want to see where people are buying? Yeah, it's the typical suspects. Manhattan, Los Angeles, Boston, Chicago, D.C., San Francisco, Hawaii. Hawaii, that's all Japan. Uh, you get Houston, Dallas. I'm sure that'll change, but you never know. Now, I, I, I want to, this for my, how many of my CCIMs are in the room? By the way, I, I get to say this. I think it's the most powerful professional designation in, in professional real estate. I will say that to my CCMs because I've said it on video. I want to show you a really quick thing, how you can compare Columbus to every major city in the country by property, commercial property type. I have a really good friend, uh, Glenn Muller, Dr. Glenn Muller. His Ph.D. in finance and real estate. He is a professor at the University of Denver. He is also an investment advisor for Dividend Capital. Dividend Capital is a multi-billion dollar REIT out of Denver. Glenn is 
one of Dividend's investment managers and advisors. So what Glenn did, he came up with this market cycles thing. And he says, you know, there are certain times you want to own real estate. And there are certain times you shouldn't own real estate. And there are certain times you ought to just sit on it. So he has these four quadrants. And I'll just show you all this stuff. Quadrant number one, phase one. you got declining vacancy. That's good news. But you're not building anything. So things are going to start improving. Phase two. We're starting to build, but vacancies are still going down. So that means rents continue to go up. Phase three. We got increasing vacancy, but we get lots of new construction coming online. Does that describe some of the markets today across the country? You bet. In phase four, where you never want to own, you get all these massive deliveries because we just overbuilt it once again. You get vacancies that are just rising. And you realize whoever owns real estate at that time, it's you ever played uh, musical chairs? You didn't get one because your chair just got pulled out. And I'm going to leave this slide in here, but so what he says is, you never want to be above that, that diamond where it says 11. You never want to be much far to that. Nationwide, our apartments are there. If we've overbuilt one thing nationwide, it's probably multifamily rental. We know we have overbuilt multifamily in Washington, D.C. It's over most overbuilt residential market in the United States of America, according to rentals. So now let me show you what Glenn says, study about Columbus, Ohio. Apartments were done. Now, we got a dilemma about apartments here. And my builders will agree with me on this. We can only build Class A apartments because our dirt costs are so high. And we ran out of lots. We haven't built any Bs or Cs, and we probably never will. If you want to look at your best thing you want to own right now, it's probably a B or C apartment project because we're going to have increasing demand at the lower income levels of rental housing. And what we overbuilt was a Class A. Who thinks I'm kind of right on this? Look at the hands go up back here, guys. So there we go. But, but there's reason we did. It was dirt cost. Industrial, industrial is the most perfect sweet spot of any property class you have here right now. You're building some, you're ramping up, and your vacancy rate still increase. Uh, vacancy rate's going down, which means rents are continuing to rise, which means you have properties that are appreciating in front of our eyes. Retail, office, and hotels are along that same track, just not as much in the construction side. Great potential in both those markets with this job growth you have. So let's talk U.S. housing sales. Uh, yeah, we had a tough year last year. We started out slow, bad winter. Um, got some good sales, just didn't come back. Home values on their head went up a bunch. All in all, um, not a bad year on housing. But here's the forecast for this year. Existing home, Fannie Mae says that uh, 2014 to 2015 will be up uh, – it was going to go up 4.4%. They said uh, this year they're looking at that. Uh, MBA says existing home sales this year will go up almost 6%. I'll show you my model on Columbus here in a minute. I'll, first of all, I'll show you what I forecast for last year, and then I'll show you the new one. New home sales. Um, who are my builders in the room? Builders? We got both of them that are left in town right over here. <laughs> By the way, builders have three incredible headwinds. Headwind number one, we ran out of lots. And any lots you're developing right now are costing a pretty penny. Am I correct? Look at the heads on this one. Number two, we used to sell 1.3 million new homes and got down to 300,000. We lost the workers that built the other million homes. You cannot find a qualified trim or finished carpenter today. Again, if you read my tweets, DRTCJ, who's tweeting with me yet? Anybody? Anybody? If you read my tweets, 72%. Uh, the builders in a national survey just a couple months ago said there was a shortage or severe shortage in trim and finish carpenters. That's almost three out of four guys. So, and then number three, um, you would not fathom how much more it's costing you to build today. Am I correct, builders? Yep. I'm going to challenge everyone in this room. If you own your home and you have not increased your insurance coverage on that house, replacement costs in the last three years, I'm willing to bet if you had a catastrophic loss of that house, you couldn't rebuild it today. So do this. Next time you renew your home insurance policy, ask your insurance company what cost construction indices have done for your property type in your neighborhood and what they'll do. They use Marshall Valuation and a few others. You need to up your coverage. Who kind of agrees with me on this now? It, it is timely on that. So let's look at your residential closings. Here's the raw stuff. It's just the number of closings per month. And uh, great news, you can kind of see it trending up. Here's the 12-month moving average. Now, I want to take off the peak in 04, 05, 06 because we gave loans to people who could never pay them back. So we knew that wasn't, it was, it was a joke, am I right? We just didn't give loans to them. We gave some people four loans. They bought four new condos. 
that they could never pay back the first one. And yeah, in 13, we actually had a real big peak in 13 because we were getting rid of all of our foreclosure and short sales. And that's gone as an aggregate. Look how the market stabilized out. And if you remove the foreclosure sales and remove the housing bubble, your home sales right now are the best they've ever been on a sustainable basis in Columbus, Ohio, in the history of this city. Is that an amazing statement? Your housing market is back. Who thinks it's back to normal like I do? I think it's back. Who doesn't think it's back to normal? Who's waiting for it to come back? If you're waiting for it to come back, look left and look right because those people did those closings you should have done last year. That's right. Look at prices. Yeah, prices have gone up. Uh, 12 month moving average, 5.62%. It says, well, you got strong job growth. You got a great outlook. You have limited listings of homes available for sale. And we got rents that kept going up and up and up. And the only thing we're building was Class A apartments. A lot of people at that stage said, I'll just buy a house. Here was my forecast from a year ago. That yellow thing I turn in, I'll show you my forecast for this year in a minute. I turn into my management. David, I owe you this from now on. I'll give it the latest one. I'm sorry. I should I'm putting it out public. I ought to give it to my local president at least. So last year, yeah, I missed some of the months. Some of the months I missed a bunch. But last year, my forecast before the year started, we're going to sell 25,246 homes in Columbus, Ohio. We ended up selling 25,776. I missed it by 530. That's, that's one-tenth of one percent. So I got a great model on y'all. But wait, wait, no, don't do that. Why it's important. I'm forecasting that same model says your housing sales this year go at 5.1%. Wow. It's job driven. Y'all get it yet? You got a great year sitting in front of you here. Just trying to tell you. Now, a year from now, the danger of putting this in print and giving it to you, if I'm wrong, 400 people will tell me next year as I walk in the door. They always do. Yeah, and I missed the first month. We missed it by 105. Gee, we, we have a complex financial term for your January weather. It sucked. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah, so we're just going from there. Buildings. This one bothers me a little bit. Uh, I'm going to tell you this. Because we built a lot. And we built more multifamily than anything else. Because it's easy to be, easier to build. It created 8,100 jobs. You added 7,133 new jobs dwelling units. That's but from apartments to, to mansions. That means you had 1.14 new jobs per new dwelling unit. We think you need one and a quarter to one and a half new jobs per new dwelling unit, which says to me, and I look at that thing, I think we just overbuilt the apartment rental market. And a lot of those permits issued last year become deliveries this year. And that's all class A stuff. Now, that's not to say if you could find a place you could afford to build B and C stuff, you could make a lot of money. It's not to say that there are certain sub-markets in this market that you could put a new Class A apartment project up and make tons of money. You know your market better than I do. I don't, but as an aggregate, I think we've overbuilt the high-end rental. So let's talk about the national economy and why I'm, I'm so excited about the national economy. Number one, we have a money supply that's sitting there doing nothing. M1 is the cash you have, whether it's in your wallet, your billfold, your purse, on your mattress, buried in your backyard. It's your demand deposits and your checking accounts. It's the most it's ever been. It earns absolutely nothing. We've increased M1 111% since January 2008, more than doubled it. And when people become confident they're going to start spending this, by the way, this is also Business America stuff, and I'm going to tell you they're doing that right now. This is total real retail sales and food service sales. Real means that we've adjusted for inflation. Now, you go back to November of last year, that's that third highest it's the highest point on the right it's a third from the end that was november and if you read in january about december retail sales you would read the headlines retail sales stumbled in december and then again if you read in february of this year about january's retail sales retail sales faltered once again don't ever believe that what happened was Included in retail sales are gasoline, diesel fuel, and jet fuel. The cost of those went down so much that sales of everything else held its own or went up. Those went down. Consumers simply had more money in their pockets, even though we were buying almost more of everything than before. So I'm trying to tell you, consumers are just now starting. Wait till those millennials 
start buying those homes or forming household units and doing apartments. Look at leisure and hospitality jobs. To me, it's always been my leading indicator of where the U.S. is. You don't go out and spend a lot of money on a vacation or a, a resort or a cruise or you know, spa or whatever unless you feel good about the future. We now have more people employed in hospitality and food service and leisure than any time in the history of the United States of America. Guys, I'm just trying to tell you, every one of the indicators, my instruments when I fly airplanes, every one of those instruments says we're right on a great track. Who remembers when I told you it was sucked and was going to go down? And was I right? Yeah, so I'm just trying to tell you that. Consumers have cleaned up their balance sheets. Of course, banks help them with this a little bit. <clears throat> this is the amount of take-home pay that people spend on their debt service. It does not include their house payment. So now we're going to include renters in here. It includes everything else, their cars, their boats, their jet skis, their snowmobiles, their credit cards. The typical consumer day spends less than 10 cents of every take-home dollar on their total credit service that month. That's the lowest it's been in over 50 years, which means consumers, they're spending less than they've spent a long time. Now part of that, A, we haven't bought much, and B, we saw in 08, 09, and 10, banks just forgave a lot of consumer debt thinking y'all would never pay it back. And yeah, so we, that all went away. What it says to me, not only do we have a lot of cash in the banks to spend, but when consumers decide it's time to buy, we're going to see borrowings go up because we're going to buy more of everything, whether it's credit cards, boats, or anything else. Lightweight vehicle sales. You're in a region that manufactures a large amount of car parts. Am I right? Well, you're in a car manufacturing region. Let's get real about it here in Columbus. You think about it. Lightweight vehicle sales. We used to sell 16 million. We got down to 9.4 million. We're in the mid 16s. We're brushing to 17 million. You'll probably see 18 million seasonally adjusted car sales in the next 12 months. Why? Because our average age fleet in the roads, 11.7 years old. It's the oldest fleet of vehicles we've had on the roads since World War II. Granted. It's probably the best fleet we've had on the roads since World War II, quality-wise and duration-wise, but they're wearing out. <laughs> if you think, you know, you think well, someone said to me at one of the meetings earlier, well, Ted, in one of your tweets, you said that the average rebate on, on our new car is 2900 bucks, whatever, whatever it is, free interest, whatever. How, how can you say that? Well, what they did, I don't know if you all knew this, most of the new car manufacturers last year increased 2015 model prices by more than 3000 and so let's say they did 5000 on some of the models. So now they're discounting 3000 which means you're still paying 2000 more than you did a year ago. Do you all get it yet? Just tells you about how well car manufacturers did, and you're one of those regions that does that. If I throw out 2.06, and this is where we get class participation. Remember, if we don't get class participation, I will call on someone. You will stand and we'll talk. You used to be a professor. But what does 2.06 mean to you? Gasoline, good answer. Bonus points, wrong answer, but bonus points anyway. That's what the 10-year treasury rate was just before I walked in here today. Now think about this. You have someone, mostly from out the United States today, that's loaning the United States for 10 years, maybe millions of dollars, at 2.06% interest per year. That does not sound exciting to me. Does it to you? The reason that long-term interest rates, 10-year, this is more to commercial business right now. I'm going to tell them my commercial people. Every commercial deal is so many basis points above this number plus your risk component for the property top and your risk component for your investors. I don't think you and I will ever see in my lifetime rates below this. The reason they're so low today, and I'll just go to this next one. We actually thought rates would go up last October because last October quantitative easing ceased. And when you cease quantitative easing, the banks and Federal Reserve was no longer printing up $85 billion of new money every month, buying securities from banks, giving the banks $85 billion of extra money every month they had to loan out. The only way they could keep it loaned out was keep the prices low so rates were kept low. And all that went away. And then we had all these global issues. We had Russia. Now think about what's going on in Russia right now, Crimea. Now think about Turkey and Greece and Syria and Egypt. And we have a Iran, Iraq, we have a globe that's worried about even getting their principal back. And if they 
can get just zero percent net interest after inflation, they'll invest. And so we have a flight to quality that at this point in time is keeping long-term rates down. I'm just trying to tell you you got a window before they go up, and they're going to go up. And look at housing. These are weekly rates. Do you all realize what interest rates have done in housing in recent weeks? No place but up. So I just forecast you, I think housing sales here will go up 5.1%. I think your home values next year go up 2 to 4%. Um, and then yet I'm forecasting interest rates go up. And someone asked me a couple weeks ago, Ted, you're nuts. You're saying rates are going up. You're saying home prices are going up. How are the people going to afford them? Do you know how many hundreds, thousands of dollars per year some households are saving because of reduced energy cost? Do you all get it yet? They already have the money in their pockets to pay that increased interest. That's different this time, and that's what's going to bail us out. For my lenders that are in the MBA, good news is, you know, 2015, we're going to get a slight increase this year, according to Fannie Mae, in total purchase transactions. In 2016, it's going to go up quite a bit more. Bad news for my lenders is uh, we're going to have a nice refi that fizzles later in the year, and next year it will be the lowest refinance residential lending we've seen since 2000. So my lenders' net revenues this year will go down again. And now you're going to have to pay all those compliance costs with CFPB. Do you all understand what a difficult economic and financial environment my lenders are operating in? It is what it is. Throughout the number 60 to you, what does the number 60 mean? What's that? My age, yes. Bonus points again. Once again, the wrong answer. If you read my blog, who reads my blog? The problem is I got seven steward employees at a table. One of them raises their hand over here. <laughs> I feel like the Rodney Dangerfield of economists, you know. October, mid-October, I wrote a blog said we'll we'll see 60 buck a barrel oil and I can make a case to be in the high 30s. How was that for a call? <laughs> oh, but what does that do to any place except perhaps um, North Dakota and Texas and Oklahoma? But it says every other place in those countries is going to have more money in their pocket. And they're going to be buying stuff. And we're going to see the biggest travel season this summer we've seen in maybe 20 or 30 or 40 years because they're going to be buying the new cars. When you buy a new car, you always like to take a vacation, am I right? Or you buy a new car before. It's going to be cheap except for hotels and they're going to go up. And let me show you, when I, when I did this, I just ran a model. We, we build models, we finance guys out of mathematics, not out of plastic. $60 barrel oil gives me oil, gasoline prices this year at $2.35 a gallon. If we average $50 a barrel, it's two oh six. Do you not understand what's going to do to your leisure and hospitality industry? Boom, city, here we come. My bad slide today, 52% of U.S. households receive some form of government benefits. Does that bother anyone here but me? The reason it bothers me is I'm paying for it. Have y'all met my worthless brother-in-law yet? <laughs> I keep talking about him every year. My concerns this year, let's iron them out and we'll get on from there. Number one, Washington, D.C. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. It doesn't make any difference. We have too many politicians and not enough leaders. Who kind of agrees with me? <laughs> let, me let, let me describe this. I think you and I have elected some very good people and sent them to Washington, and they catch a virus when they get there. That virus says, I will do anything to get reelected because I crave the power. I think you really need term limits in the House and the Senate. That's just my thoughts. By the way, that's a states' right issue. It's not the uh, Senate, okay? So we can do that. Um, we just need, and, and by the way, a leader is a person sometimes that will make a call that is so politically unpopular they may get elected out of office, but it's a good thing to do. Y'all with me on that? GSEs, my other concern. If, for some reason, the Senate, Republican-controlled Senate and House were to say, let's do away with Fannie or Freddie, I just destroyed my residential lending conduit in the United States of America. And we, we shouldn't do that. Who agrees? Keep Fannie and Freddie. Now, I will tell you this. I think you ought to merge Fannie and Freddie into one. One board of directors, one CEO, one CFO. One underwriting machine. Who kind of agrees with that? That's stupid to have two of them out there. We have a rural land bubble, and this is not going to be popular if you have farm ground or a relative has farm ground in the state that they're producing and making chunks of money because they're selling corn for ethanol. This is George W. Bush's, it's just his folly, it's stupid. When Bush decided we're going to make ethanol, alcohol, out of corn, 
what we did was we drove up since 2005 to the peak. Corn values went up 500%. Rural land values in the Midwest went up 600%. So for the short run, your local community banks and your local farmers got rich. Because you and I, the government was paying them a buck a gallon to subsidize ethanol production to go into gasoline. And I've been telling you now for two years, I thought that, that sooner or later we're going to realize that you don't save any oil making ethanol. It takes as much oil to produce the corn to make ethanol as you get out of the ethanol. It didn't save any energy. It made temporarily farmers and bankers in the Midwest rich, temporarily. Huh. And I always thought that sooner or later, the House and the Senate are going to realize this subsidy's stupid. Because what you did is you drove up the price of food for everyone. Look what beef prices have done, just to get an example. And drove up rural land values, and we didn't save any energy. And boy, was I wrong. You didn't have to repeal the subsidies on ethanol to get people not to use anymore. Gasoline is now so cheap that the gasoline makers are putting gasoline as an additive into gasoline instead of ethanol. <laughs> A month ago, I was, spent two weeks, gave 21 speeches in southwest Florida and, and, and that region. And uh, five of the gas stations I went to said, our gasoline contains no ethanol. I go inside, I said, that's awesome. When did you guys make that call? He says, when it got cheaper to buy it. Isn't that amazing? So I actually think uh, we will repeal some of the ethanol subsidies. And even if we don't, cheap oil is going to ruin the ethanol market. Oh, and now let me tell you about your local Midwest bankers. You get a small community or a regional bank. They've made a lot of money loaning that local farmer money to buy new trucks and tractors and combines and new rural land and inflated values. And when those corn values go down, they lose it all. Tragically. FDIC says 300 Midwest banks go out of business if corn values drop into the 20%. That's tragic. That's Newton's third law of motion for every action is equal and opposite reaction. Inflation and interest rates. I'm not worried about inflation. If you pay cash or have a fixed rate loan, if you don't and you lose it, you're on your own. You're forewarned. Government revenues and regulations. This does scare me a little bit. Why? Ah, because we're getting fat cats again. President's come out and says, you know, a year from now, we're only going to run a little over half a trillion dollar annual deficit. Only half a trillion. And I'll, I'll pick on Bush, I'll pick on President Obama here. I'm not fans of either. Is that a fair statement? Can y'all tell that yet? President Obama comes in. There's 10.2 trillion of federal debt. If we do nothing and don't change anything when he leaves, there'll be 20.6 trillion. You'll have doubled it. Here's the dilemma you have. We're coming up to a debt ceiling. We have to increase our debt ceiling because we don't have the cash flow to make the interest payments and make our current payments on all of our programs without increasing how much we can borrow. In other words, we don't have enough tax revenue now to support what we're doing. Oh, now let me throw out this twist. So you're going to have doubled the amount the country owes just from the federal government. And what if that 10-year Treasury, which today was 2.06%, becomes 6.18%? Uh, it goes up threefold. So you double the debt. And now you've got to increase the interest payment by a factor of three, which means our interest payments in eight years went up by a factor of 600%. And remember, we don't have the money to pay for it now. Does that bother anyone in here? Bothers me, I'll just tell you that. Well, here's my second GoPro picture. <laughs> what do you think? Now, that's in that same bay. It's one of the locals there, so to speak. That turtle's about three feet long. I thought that was kind of cool. Nothing's easy, I've decided in life. <laughs> I kind of like my job compared to this guy's job. Who agrees with me on this one? <laughs> you got to love this. You know, sometimes we got to look and see our folly. You got to love this one. Corrosion, resistant materials. You think, that's a bad truck for you guys to have on the road. Remember I showed you the pictures last year of all the people climbing rock without anything? This one's just as bad. This is a trail in China. Who's game on this one? So you got a you got a chain there and you got a wood thing to, and of course you can't even see. It. So here they are out there, and they pay money to do this. Who's gonna go pay good money to do this? You know, and this one's even. Uh, uh. Do y'all understand? There's idiots out there. <laughs> Not everyone is the same like I am. 
Now, I am from Texas, and everything's big in Texas. Who in here has played beer pong? <laughs> that means about another 100 people are lying because that wasn't enough hands. <laughs> so, and but today's a great day. I have to tell you, this is going to be a very difficult week on Ted's liver because today is St. Patrick's Day. We're going to start a little later. And then I go to New Orleans for two conventions. I tell you, it's going to be a great week. But So when you play beer pong, how many of y'all, do you ever take a beer pong game to someone's house? He's like a package of cups and a ping pong ball, case of beer. I want you to think differently. I want you to think bigger. you got an incredible economy this year, more jobs than ever before. Good job growth rate for Ohio, even though it's a third of what the U.S. is. Um, you've got a great opportunity coming here, good leadership in this community. So I want you to think Texas style, think big. This is beer pong in Texas. <laughs> so when we head over to friends' houses for a barbecue in the summertime. We go to Lowe's. You can go to Home Depot if you want a Homer bucket. And we buy a volleyball for four bucks at Walmart. We buy a case of beer and we get six of these buckets for 36 bucks. Is, who else is going to have one of these this summer? <laughs> you talk about a cool $50 gift, go do it. It's not rocket science. Now, fixing things that are wrong isn't as difficult. Our big issue is defining the problem because we never define the problem right. We have a major national company right now that's struggling. Yeah, it's home is the United States of America. It's publicly traded. It's global. Uh, they do use real estate. They're not in the real estate business. What company am I thinking of? They've had just sales go down. McDonald's. Someone said McDonald's. Yes. McDonald's, they're spending a billion bucks on consultants, a new ad campaign. They don't need to spend a dime. They need to define their problem. We used to go to McDonald's because you what, had five things on the menu, two, two sizes of fries and four drinks, apple pies, and y'all get me on this? Have you looked at a McDonald's menu lately? It's, it's like putting together a jet engine. Here's what McDonald's needs to do to get out of their issue and not spend another dime on this. They need to put beer on the value menu. <laughs> now you think about it. You get beer on the value menu, you get a cheeseburger for a buck. You go in there, I want uh, three beers and cheeseburger. You give them five, you get money back. As McDonald's would say, I'm loving it. You know, y'all, who thinks I'm right about this? We get too complex, too calculated. Now I've heard for years that China's become the global, they're going to take over everything China is. So here are some tags on clothing made in China. This one happens to be sold in New Zealand. Size L, made in China, class D slash N, day or night use only. The hell else is there? <laughs> and my favorite one from China, size three, four year old, 100% polyester, wash inside out, remove child before washing, <laughs> made in China. Do you understand they're not going to dominate the world yet? <laughs> Here we go. How to speak Australian. How to speak Australian. <laughs> Hybrid. <laughs> beer. Foster's Australian for beer. Yeah. Have y'all ever wondered how long it will take to pay the premium on a new hybrid with today's gasoline costs? I would have blog on it, but my general counsel said I couldn't tell people how much money they just lost, so I didn't do that. So here we go. Soccer season. Who loves soccer? I like soccer. Played it in New Zealand, all this kind of stuff. And I think you guys are out there to make a goal this year again. I think you score. I think you scored last year. I think your economy's on track. A little worried about your high-end multifamily housing. That's the only thing I'm worried about here. You're in the sweet spot on everything else. So here we go. Scoring. Soccer. <laughs> <laughs> Can 
you imagine these two different countries, their guards, whoever get the ball across? You just got to love it. Guys, go out there and score this year. You're going to have a heck of a year, I do believe. You're in the right place at the right time. Our U.S. economy is booming so much more than any of our politicians realize. It's because of you and me and what we do, because you do make it a better place. It is an honor and privilege to be in front of y'all, um, and I thank you for having me back. Look forward to it in the future again, too. Thank you all very, very much.